joining us now from WSO2, uh, talking about decentralized reference architecture. We've got a couple of talks actually um, today about uh, the importance of reference architecture. So um, I'm glad you're helping set the stage on this topic, Asanka, for us. Um, how's your slide deck going? Well, there we've got the yep. inception, the inception view, or tenant view, as they say, we should say now. Okay, wonderful. I'll leave the stage and leave you to it. Thanks, Mark. Uh, hi, uh, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening uh, from uh, 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 folks uh, joining from various parts of the world. So I'm joining from California. It's uh, uh, early morning for me. Uh, so I'm Asan Kabesing, the Chief Technology Evangelist at WSO2. Uh, so WSO2 is a technology company that we provide uh, integration, um, and security related uh, middleware uh, in cloud and on premise mode. Uh, but today I'm not going to talk about WSO2. Um, so it's about a concept that we built some time back uh, that I will be digging deep during the next uh, uh, 20 to 25 minutes. So before jumping into that, I'll give a quick introduction about myself. Uh, so I born in Sri Lanka. Uh, so if you are not aware about Sri Lanka, it's a small island in the Indian Ocean. And I um, uh, studied at Ireland and are now living in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. So I play basketball. So these are my heroes. And I used to live next to the Levi Stadium. So I follow um, American football. And even what happened with uh, the Linkin Park, uh, still 75% uh, of my audio library is packed with uh, Linkin Park uh, audios. And this is my family. And this is the new addition to our family. So that's my personal profile. And uh, this is my um, yeah, professional profile. So I started my career as a football programmer. Uh, some time back and then slowly moved into Java and then got into the architecture, uh, started a, a startup that uh, built a hedge fund tool and then joined WSO2 in 2008 and did most of the uh, uh, fix HL7 event in type of implementation and gradually move into uh, the current position, position as a chief technology evangelist. Um, so that's my uh, professional career. So as I explained earlier, what I'm trying to do during the next uh, 20 to 25 minutes is to explain why we create a new pattern and then how we created this pattern as well as uh, detailly explain uh, what it, it is. And my idea here, uh, my goal today to give you a data point that you can go and read the specification to find more information about this pattern. So the reason behind why we introduce a new pattern, we found there's a mismatch in the industry that uh, the architects are looking for a, a new architecture style or a pattern, but the existing reference architectures were not addressing that particular requirement. So I'll explain why uh, it is not addressing. The first uh, thing that we realize, uh, the existing architecture patterns are uh, centralized and layered. So this is an issue when it comes to uh, agile development, uh, because if you look at the diagram that uh, shows in the screen, uh, the, uh, the layered and centralized architecture creating a lot of uh, blockers, or we call them as gates in between the layers, and it uh, slow down the developer flow. So the developers required to wait uh, to get something done from another team and that stopped the agility and even uh, we call is uh, call these uh, processes are agile. It is not truly agile due to this uh, architecture pattern that we were using for a while. And then if you look at the architecture diagrams, most of the architects are doing, uh, the, it's very clean and very neat uh, as you see in the diagram. But if you look at the actual architecture inside the organization, it's not like that. Because we purchase a lot of software, a lot of data solutions, a lot of uh, uh, cost of uh, a lot of the different type of uh, application platforms during the last two decades. And we require all these uh, uh, systems to run the business. So we can't throw them away and then build a clean architecture like I uh, described in the previous slide. So the reality of the enterprise is look like this. And then we have to uh, deal with that uh, due to many reasons. And then the, the reality of the uh, industry is 
even we are trying to move into greenfield we have a lot of legacy and monolithical systems existing reference architectures are either addressing one uh, spectrum of this either addressing legacy monolith or either addressing microservices and uh, the latest greenfield stuff so we thought of implement something that can used in both sides or uh, somebody can uh, go into hybrid mode then the next thing is most of the reference architectures available are reference implementations why i'm claiming that because those are biased to a technology and or a vendor so what we thought define something completely technology and uh, vendor neutral so that way you can use any technology uh, stack that you are planning to use or currently you are using in your enterprise uh, then the uh, next motivation is the under utilization of the technology because the architecture patterns that we are using are not flexible enough to bring new technology into the picture or uh, change existing technologies so we thought of have that full agility of the architecture itself that you should be able to use the technologies that you are planning to or uh, desire to use then the uh, another thing that we identified there's a gap in between the architecture development and the deployment or uh, between the architect developer and the devops engineer there because there's no common thing that you can carry from architecture into development and development into the deployment so uh, this is another thing that we thought that we should have something common that you can take it from the design space or the architecture uh, stage into uh, the deployment stage then with microservices coming into the picture the dependence management is key uh, we need to give autonomy for uh, the teams but we need to have some sort of governance across these uh, services as well this is a uh, uh, like a famous diagram that uber published some time back um, uh, so uh, uh, about their uh, microservices landscape <coughs> sorry so before jumping to the new pattern let's take a look at what type of architecture patterns we were using uh, during the last two decades so it's, it's basically started with the uh, the layered architectures the monolithical architecture and then it moved to the 2t architecture when the data technologies uh, got advanced and then the most interesting era came with uh, the 3t architecture uh, with uh, use interfaces business logic and data uh, divided into three uh, layers and there were a lot of sub patterns came with the 3d architecture that model view control and then service oriented architecture came and uh, the sub patterns of service oriented architecture like event driven architecture web oriented architecture uh, came uh, into the picture as well then in uh, 2012 2011 time frame the microservices architecture came and what i wanted to highlight in this diagram the layered architecture slowly move into a segmented architecture style. So this is a, a layered architecture diagram that I uh, introduced sometime back in 2010, 2011 timeframe. If you look at it, it is a little bit different to a traditional layered architecture, uh, that it is two dimensional, that uh, addition to the layers that I identify using the system of system uh, concept, I introduced uh, the developer life cycle as well as uh, the, sorry application life cycle as well as the quality of services that we add like security governance and monitoring into this same architecture diagram so this was a very powerful diagram that we used a lot to build systems as well as had many productive discussions so at the same time we uh, faced uh, uh, experience that uh, agile team that follow uh, agile principles did fail in delivering a project when we dig into that uh, particular scenario we identified the failure is due to the architecture that was not flexible or the architecture is not enough um, uh, to add, add, add uh, the, um, uh, the the agility that they were looking from the uh, process uh, or the uh, project uh, uh, delivery side so this was a eye opener for us and at the same time microservices came into the picture as well and interestingly if you look at the uh, the, the pioneers of microservices or so early adapters of the microservices uh, like netflix uber ebay they started using another layer on top of the microservices even the theory uh, of microservices used to say a different type of uh, uh, concepts so if you look at the architecture started and microservices became another layer of the same layered cake uh, that uh, the other 
the rest of the components like analytics, security, and the gateway components were besides on top of the uh, microservices and microservices became another layer. So this didn't solve the problem, but we saw there's a movement of um, the industry uh, use the same layered architecture, but in a segmented way that different business units try to keep some isolation using multi-tenancy or uh, like uh, some partitioning mechanism, and then uh, try to be a uh, little bit isolated and create more and more autonomy in their uh, spaces. And some of the, uh, the organization, they started uh, deploying the entire platform for that particular business unit and started duplicating the, uh, the environment to have more control. So I call it as platform or platforms. Again, the architecture was layered, but it creates some agility for the organization, but this was not uh, a solution for us. So we hit a dead end at that point and we thought, okay, we need to start thinking new and then look at something that uh, can change uh, the current layered architecture. So we started doing the normal way of doing research, reading books and then uh, research papers, but we narrowed down our research into the uh, uh, four key areas. In addition to the materials that I explained, we talked to a lot of customers and uh, users of uh, WSO2 as well to get some ideas, especially the architecture community. So we narrowed down our uh, research into these four areas about con quantum computing and Kubernetes got a really good set of um, distributed uh, architecture features, uh, as well as we uh, looked at uh, biology and system biology. You will understand why uh, when I'm explaining about the architecture pattern in detail. So uh, we, we stuck our, um, uh, move our uh, research into these four areas in detail. Uh, at the same time, we looked at the business and technical services concept as well. This is a topic came while we talked to many architects before we uh, draw the uh, architecture paper. So if you look at the technical definition of a service, it's nothing big that uh, you create a set of code and then you annotate it and make it a network accessible uh, piece of uh, function that can uh, uh, access through a network using a specific message format and a, a specific uh, protocol. So, but the definition or the requirement coming from business is different. They are looking for uh, some kind of a, a solution for a business problem. To provide a solution to a business problem, you have to connect multiple services into uh, one single service. So you have to use a gateway, a ESB, or a, a composite service to achieve that. And the microservices definition also uh, not a big difference that you uh, like uh, divide the big services into small services based on the scope, not depend on the size. Uh, but the uh, implementation looks like same that you annotate or create some kind of a, uh, interface that can access the functionality through a uh, network interface. And then the, the business definition or the business requirement for a microservice is also same. That the business is looking for some business capabilities to uh, achieve some business goals. So to do that, you need to put um, combine uh, multiple micro microservices and uh, using a gateway or composite services. So in these two uh, exercises, what we identify, you have to group services. So either a micro or a normal service, you need to group services to bring it uh, value or bring give a business value to this particular service. So uh, that is the uh, start of this concept called cell. That grouping, we uh, call it as a cell. So the architecture is cell-based architecture. That's where the biology and system biology came into the picture. So the atomic component of this architecture, we call it as a component. Component can be anything, a database, a service, microservice, a broker, a message a bus, or anything that you run in your data center, we uh, treat it as a component. So the combination of uh, these um, uh, components, we call it as a cell. It's a set of or a collection of components. And the uh, the main feature of uh, a cell, there's a cell gateway that will uh, control the uh, risk, uh, uh, the uh, basically the uh, calls to the uh, internal components. And then there are other components inside the cell doing various type of functionalities to achieve a business goal. 
The cell uh, and the component can be one to many in most of the cases, but there can be situations cell and the component can be one to one as well. Then the cells are connected using this uh, famous concept called the uh, concept with management plane, data plane, and the control plane. I'm not going in detail about that. Uh, so if you look at there's the intercell communication and the intracell communication that I call the uh, the inner um, uh, communication as a local mesh and uh, the outer communication as a global mesh. And if you look at there's a control plane and a data plane within the cell, as well as there's a control plane, data plane, and a management plane outside the cell as the global mesh so if you are family with service mesh this is service mesh plus plus because we have two layers that will be helping to do the communication then the cells are connected and any ingress call coming to the cell uh, should come through the cell gateway but uh, the egress calls going out from the cell can use sidecar adapter ambassador type of uh, microservices and container friendly patterns and this is an API first architecture. If you look at the intercell communication happens through an API and cell to cell communication happens through an API as well. So it can be a pull API or a push API uh, using restful events or streams um, like that. And the gateway pattern here helping us a lot because you can enforce policies at the gateway as well as you can automatically enable the observability at the gateway level. So it is helping us to uh, add some governance as a problem we identified at the beginning. The so security of the cell is uh, very important as well. There are two patterns. A cell can be self-contained uh, security uh, mechanism that uh, the internal control plane will provide all the security uh, related uh, information, or it can go and uh, fetch uh, additional information from IDP and cache them inside the cell to have high performance. So both patterns are um, valid. The developer experience doesn't uh, change. People can create brand new cells or they can convert existing microservices, or update a cells or create a new version. And if you look at this diagram, the default developer flow will not break. They will build, test, and then push the stuff. And depending on the infrastructure layer that you are using, you will push the cell or a component into the infrastructure. Uh, the life cycle of a cell contains a version and each and every component running inside the cell contains a version as well. So this will allow you to do blue green deployments, canary deployments or rainbow deployments in your infrastructure. And this creates more agility that I call it as a structured agility that you will get agility at the component level. You will get agility at the cell level and you will get agility at the enterprise level. So it's a three uh, level agility that you will get with this concept. And if you look at the cell-based uh, enterprise architecture, it will look like it looks like this because you will see a lot of cells running in your enterprise. And we can categorize those cells into logic, integration, legacy, external data, identity channel, uh, like that so these are like very high level classifications but based on your domain and uh, your use cases you might uh, require additional cells as well but uh, these uh, cell types can address most of the use cases that uh, we can find in the industry so if you look at a reference implementation uh, this is a, a implementation with the employee cell or the cell customer cell that will uh, depend and uh, connect with many other cells in your uh, infrastructure and then if you look at the uh, implementation using the same uh, reference implementation you can use any technology i have used a couple of wso2 technologies as well as uh, things like uh, uh, spring boot nginx uh, any other technology can be used because the architecture is completely technology and uh, vendor neutral uh, this is a very human-centric architecture why I claim that cell can be a team boundary as well. Uh, so one team can own many cells, but uh, one cell cannot be owned by many uh, teams. So that is the concept that we are recommending that will provide a lot more agility for your team. So if you are interested about the human-centric part of it, you can read this uh, article that I published in Forbes about how a cellular enterprise can build using a cell-based architecture and extend it from the architecture concept into culture and uh, uh, process uh, people type of uh, other uh, things that we need to address.
The cell boundaries is a common question people are asking, so I have explained it in detail in the specification. Uh, but domain-driven design is one angle that you can uh, take a look when you are defining the cell boundaries. Then measuring the success is um, a key uh, component because even you uh, move to a a new architecture pattern your business stakeholders might question so there are two uh, key things that you can uh, use one is the flow efficiency since this is a very agile architecture uh, the productive time is really high so your flow efficiency is really high so that will be good measurements and the agility uh, we create here will um, improve the mttt or the mean time to uh, repair or mttd the mean time to detect uh, so you should be able to add new features as well as fix the existing issues without any delay. So in summary, a cell is a, a self-contained uh, unit and you can deploy it as a unit and you can independently uh, scale it at the component level as well as gateway level. And there's a local data plane and a control plane. And if you look at this uh, service architecture, it's a decentralized microservices friendly and cloud native architecture, a completely technology neutral, human centric, and you can build APIs as a product using the API centric uh, features that I explained earlier. So the contribution to this effort, actually, this is the URL to the uh, specification uh, that you can read. It is released under Creative Commons, so uh, you can uh, give a git star if you like it, or you can send a pull request with uh, your feedback. In addition to that, I have authored the reference methodology on how you implement the reference architecture. And these are a few other links that Ballerina.io can use to uh, um, develop components in this architecture. And then you can use any AWS component as a um, uh, product, as a component in the architecture, as well as we did a, a pilot project called Celery.io as a reference implementation. Uh, so you can take a look at that as well. So these are my contact information if you need to have in touch with me to get any architecture advice or uh, contribute to this uh, specification uh, my linkedin contact email as well as you can follow me on twitter so that's uh, it i have line up and uh, i think uh, wonderful if there are any questions i can take it let me stop sharing uh, yeah thanks yeah. wonderful asanka that was a uh, great really interesting way to move um, discussions forward by thinking about uh, describing and modeling architecture around uh, cells. The, you did talk about, um, uh, so one thing that's been asked from Dennis in the chat is, is there an academic paper or a white paper that presents the cell-based architectural pattern? Yes, yeah, so I won't say it's an academic paper per se, it's an industry paper. Uh, mm -hmm. So yes, it is available and I put the link in my slides as well. Uh, so I'll share the slides, but if you want uh, a quick uh, um, link, then just uh, ping me on uh, Twitter or somewhere like that, or uh, ping me on LinkedIn, I'll share the link. Sure, you share the link. Uh, I'll, I'll also post it in the chat as we go. Okay. Um, and then while you're doing that, just one other um, question that's, that I was thinking is, so earlier in your slide, you talk about um, how to describe um, various issues in from a business point of view, rather than a technical point of view. Are you finding when you describe architecture as a cellular model, is that something, for, as an analogy, is it something that the business people are sort of being able to then understand the sort of infrastructure that they've got to work with is that helping because sometimes um business people they either tune out when yeah. we talk about uh technology or it's very confusing how all of the pieces work together yeah so i think that is where the team synergy comes there as well because we can easily define a team as a cell at the uh, at the business level as well as an application or a project as uh, multiple cells so i'm not recommending to have the uh, like circular uh, kind of dependencies like uh, cell inside a cell but you can have many dependencies to a cell so that way you can explain uh, this is how we have created boundaries uh, so that uh, might be a good definition for the business uh, um, audience. Okay, cool. That's great. Let's put the link up and then we'll move on to our next presentation.